Welcome to the Canadian edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 55 years of ministry. Andrew, I want to personally say thank you for, for what you have been able to do for us in your, your adamant pursuit of the Word um, and how you have not wavered. You've not gotten into the grandstands and you have delivered that to us. I might be one voice, but I represent millions and millions of changed lives. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing to teach through a series that I've entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body. This is one of the very first things that the Lord ever showed me, and actually this has become a key to understanding everything in the Word of God, everything about who I am in Christ, everything about my relationship with God, and we're giving this book away. And we not only have it in English, we have it in Spanish, we have a study guide, we have an audio book, we have CDs, DVDs, a USB, and we even have a little illustrated uh, teaching on this where it's me teaching, but somebody from Germany just took and uh, illustrated this, and it's really neat. Matter of fact, Amy, the lady who runs our camera, told me after yesterday's program that she tried to share this with people, and uh, when she shared that little video, people got it uh, through that video that they didn't get it other way. So it's not just for kids. This is just, uh, all of this material is just to try and help you get hold of these truths, and these are the truths that literally transform my life and I believe that they had worked for you. So yesterday, I haven't got time to go back through everything, but it's your spirit that got born again, not your body and not your soul. There's a third part of you, the spirit, that you can't see or feel. The only way you can understand what is true about you in the spirit is to go to the Word of God and trust what it says. And yesterday, I was sharing out of Hebrews chapter 9 that the Scripture says about all of these pieces of uh, you know, furniture that were in the tabernacle and in the temple. It was relating them to something that affects us today. But when it got to the cherubims that were in the Holy of Holies that were there, these cherubims were warrior angels. And if any person came into the Holy of Holies where the ark of God was, where the presence of God was, they would be struck dead because you just couldn't approach unto God. Not that God hated us. It's that God is so pure and so holy, he, we just can't contain that glory. It would literally just cause you to die. You, you couldn't handle it. But it says here in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, talking about the cherubs, it says, and over at the cherubs of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. The reason they couldn't speak about them is because in the new covenant, Jesus tore the veil. That was his flesh, Hebrews chapter 10. We talked about that. And we can now access the very presence of God. We can go into the holy of holies without any fear of being struck by the cherubs. So they don't apply to us today. There is a new and living way that we have right into the very throne a room of God, into the very presence of God. And sad to say, many Christians are not taking advantage of this New Testament reality because we still are under the old covenant law mentality that focused on our flesh. The law showed you your physical actions, your mental, emotional thoughts, but it didn't show you who you were in the spirit. In the Old Testament, people could not be born again. They didn't get a brand new spirit. So in a sense, the only way they could worship God was in the flesh through sacrifice and offerings. We don't offer sacrifices today because Jesus was the one sacrifice for our sins to end all sacrifices. And now we can come boldly into the very presence of God because we have a brand new spirit that was created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4:24, 1 John 4:17. as Jesus is, so are we in this world. And because of that, we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 8, it says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying, talking about uh, as long as the cherubs was there, as long as the veil was still uh, in one piece, as long as there was this separation of sinful man from holy God, it says in verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. 
which was a figure for the time then present. In other words, it was correct in the old covenant, but it's not correct for us today. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and in divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation. That's talking about our time. There has been a reformation take place. The way that people worshiped in the Old Testament was looking forward to a sacrifice that would bring us into the very presence of God. Now, in the New Testament, we are looking back to what Jesus did, what has already been purchased for us. So there is a huge difference between the way people worshiped in the Old Testament and the way that they worship in this New Testament. In verse 10, it says, "...which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of Reformation." But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Man, I've got so much to say about this. There is so much in that verse, but let me just point out that what he's doing is contrasting the way people worshiped God, the way they approached God in the old covenant. They had to do it with an animal sacrifice, with blood, with meat offerings, with different washings, all of the feast days. They had to go through all of these things. In the new covenant, we can now enter boldly into the very presence of God, into the holy of holies, because the veil of his body has been broken for us the separation between God and our born-again spirit is non-existent now. As Jesus is, so are we in this world, 1 John 4, 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Uh, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We are united with God in spirit, and we no longer have this separation. And let me just point out a couple of the things it says right here. It says that... Uh, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Man, this is phenomenal. I'm going to say some things right here that I'm not going to be able to fully answer on today's program. I, you're going to have to listen the rest of this week. And also, please get this book. I'm giving it to you, and it will go into more detail. But did you know that the average Christian believes that when you come to the Lord and you make Him your Lord, that He forgives your sins up until that point. All of the sins that you committed before you got born again were forgiven. But then they believe that every time you sin, after you get born again, every time you fall short in any way, that that is a new transgression between you and God, and you have to go and get that confessed and put under the blood, or God will reject you. Now, you have extremes on how much He will reject you. The Pentecostals will say that if you have any sin in your life, and if you haven't confessed that sin, repented of it, turned away from it, and put it, what they call, under the blood, well, then you would die and go to hell. Even though you could have been born again for 40 years and have been serving God your whole life, but if you do something wrong... And if you die before you get it confessed, you would die and go to hell because you had an unconfessed sin in your life. And then a lesser consequence, but the same principle, is what the evangelicals believe, and that is that, no, you don't lose your salvation. You would still go to heaven, but you can't have any fellowship with God. You can't enjoy the presence of God. God won't use you if you have an unconfessed sin in your life. That's the same principle, just with a lesser consequence. It's like taking a stick and saying, here's one end of the stick that says, no, you die and go to hell with an unconfessed sin. Here's, an, here's the other end of the stick saying, no, you don't go to hell. You just lose your fellowship and all of the benefits of your salvation. But it's like the same thing. It's just lesser consequences. I'm telling you that God went and only died for your sins once. You do not have to go to the Lord every time you sin. 
And again, let me just say, trying to preempt television sets turning off all over the world. Let me just say that I'm not going to be able to fully explain this on just today's program. You need to get the teaching. You need to watch tomorrow's program and the rest of this week. I am not saying that you just go live in sin and that sin doesn't matter to a Christian because all of your sins have been forgiven. But what I am saying is that when you got born again, Jesus entered in once, once into the holy place and he obtained eternal redemption for us. Not redemption until the next time you sinned and then you had to confess it and get it under the blood and get born again again. No, he entered in once and obtained eternal redemption for you. That's a concept that very, very, very few people have. Again, most Christians believe that when you get saved, He forgave all of your past sins. But then every time you sin in the future, you've got to go to God, you've got to repent and get that sin forgiven, or you would die and go to hell, or at the very least, He won't use you, He won't fellowship with you, you can't enjoy any of your benefits as long as there's any sin in your life. I'm telling you, that's bondage. That's not what the Scripture teaches. This says that he entered in once into that holy place, the holy of holies, and he obtained eternal redemption for us. Redemption is referring to the forgiveness of your sins, eternal forgiveness of sins. And just for time's sake, I'm going to jump through a couple of verses. If you go to verse 15, it says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, by, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Again, the average Christian believes that your inheritance is only uh, good up until the time you're, you got born again and all of your past sins were forgiven. And then if you were going to continue to have an inheritance every time you sin, you got to go to the Lord and get that sin under the blood and you got to regain your inheritance. But this talks about eternal inheritance, eternal redemption. Which part of eternal do you not understand? This is saying that when you come to the Lord and get born again, all of your sins... I'm going to make a radical statement, and if you can stick with me, I'll verify this. But all of your sins, past, present, and even future sins are forgiven when you come to the Lord and get born again. And again, I can just hear minds blowing all around the world, uh, fuses being blown. What are you saying? I'm saying that Jesus forgave all of your sins, all of the sins you had committed are committing, and all of the sins you will ever forget. When you get born again, you weren't forgiven just up until the time that you got saved, but you were forgiven of the sins that you haven't even committed yet. And again, I know that some people are just freaking out at this and saying, what are you saying? I'm saying that when Jesus died for you and for me and made an atonement for our sins, did you know all of our sins were future sins? If God can't forgive sins before you commit them, then you can't be forgiven because Jesus only died for your sins once. As it says in verse 12, He entered in once, one time, into the holy place, having made eternal redemption for us. Jesus doesn't just forgive you of sins up until the time you get born again and then every sin that you commit along the way you have to get it forgiven and deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, the extreme Pentecostal view is that you lose your salvation and you could go to hell. Or the lesser consequence, but the same principle evangelically is you don't lose your salvation, you just lose the benefits of your salvation. He won't fellowship with you. He won't use you. You can't experience His joy if you have any sin in your life. What's wrong with that is that we all sin. Now, again, we have varying degrees of sin from our standpoint. And some people look at sins like murder is different than just being angry at somebody. But, you know, Jesus came along and said, if you hate a person in your heart, you're guilty of murder. He, he said that if you have lusted 
after a woman in your heart, then you're guilty of adultery. And from a human standpoint, there is a difference in just, you know, being angry with a person and then going out and killing them. The consequences of killing them are much worse from a human perspective. But from God's perspective, we are still falling short in these areas. It says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. That means that even though you may not go murder a person, if you take offense, if you get hurt, if you are thinking things about them, if you gossip about a person, did you know you're guilty? It's just the same in, the, in one sense. It's the same. It's not the same as far as consequences go with people, but in, as far as God, you're guilty of sin when you get mad at a person because they've hurt you, because they've done something. You know, it's like God's law is like a glass. And if you had a huge glass in front of you and me, you could shoot a bullet through that thing and make a small hole, or you could run a truck through that glass. If you break the glass, the whole glass is broken and it has to be replaced. Even though from a human standpoint, yes, there is a different degree of sin with different consequences, but from God's standpoint, if you keep the whole law, and yet if you offend in one point, you become guilty of all. Did you know there was actually a man, a Pentecostal preacher in Colorado Springs that preached, if you went 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, and if you had an unconfessed sin in your life, then you would die and go to hell because you did not have time to repent of that sin and confess it before you died. Did you know most people watching this program think, no way. I, I would imagine that every single person watching this program says, I don't believe that. Why? Because you go 56 in a 55 mile an hour zone. And to you, that's not that big of a deal. But let me ask, let me put it this way. There are some of you that if I said that you had been out committing adultery and you were driving home from an adulterous affair and if you had a car wreck and died in that car wreck, you'd die and go to hell. There's many of you that would say, oh no, it wouldn't happen over going 56 in a 55 mile an hour zone. But if you had committed adultery, some of you would say, well, yes, you would go to hell because you didn't have time to confess it. That's not true. That's not true. If I really believe that, then the moment you got born again, I'd just kill you. I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven. Because see, not only is committing adultery and violating one of the big 10, the 10 commandments sin, but to him that knows to do good and does it not. To him it is sin, James 4, 17. Whatsoever not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. If you aren't living a perfect life of faith, if you know that, that you should be doing good, you should be studying more, you should be praying more, you should be helping more, you should be more involved in helping doing other things in what you're doing. And if you aren't doing it, well, then that's sin. And if you believe that sin is somehow or another going to separate you from God and every sin's got to be repented of, then you would just spend your entire life living in a constant state of unworthiness and repentance like, oh God, how could you ever use someone like me? And you know what I'm describing is exactly the way that most Christians live. They know that God exists. They know that He's almighty. They know that He has all power. They don't doubt His power. They just doubt His willingness to use His power on their behalf because they live with a sin consciousness because they don't understand what this is saying. They think that they were only forgiven of sins up until the point they got born again. And then every time they mess up, every time they fall short, they've got to go to God and get that sin confessed and under the blood. That's not what this is teaching. This is teaching that Jesus dealt with sins once for all. One sacrifice for your sin and my sin forever. I got born again when I was eight years old. And did you know that at that time, God forgave me of all the sins I had committed or ever would commit? I was forgiven once and for all. Again, I'm going through this kind of slowly trying to verify this, but I'm going to be talking about this. In the 10th chapter, it talks about you've been sanctified and perfected once for all. You know, right here in the ninth chapter, I think that there's either four or five times that it emphasizes that Jesus only died for our sins once. 
He only entered into the holy place once. Jesus is not constantly reapplying the blood every time a person sins and comes short and then they recognize it, they repent and go back to the Lord. He doesn't have to reapply his blood. You know, there are millions, possibly billions of Christians around this world. And if Jesus had to uh, reapply his blood every time a person sinned and confessed that sin and turned from it. There would be no such thing as him seated at the Father's right hand. He would be up and down constantly because I guarantee there are millions of Christians every day who are messing up saying, oh, God, forgive me. And if he had to reapply the blood, it just couldn't even happen. He dealt with sin once and then he seated at the Father's right hand, implying that He's no longer working and doing something. What He did for you and me, He did for us 2,000 years ago when Jesus died and brought His blood into the heavenly uh, temple and made the atonement on the altar and He purged us of all sins, past, present, and even sins that we haven't committed yet. That's nearly too good to be true. And I know that there's people watching this who are saying, man, if people believe that, that would just encourage them to go live in sin. Well, no, it wouldn't. Because the love of Christ would constrain us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said that. He says the love of Christ constrains us. It's the, the love of Christ will cause you to live holier accidentally than you've ever lived on purpose out of fear of punishment and rejection. Basically, most people try and live a holy life because they're afraid God won't answer their prayer and won't do things for them if they don't do everything right. Fear is a motivator, but fear has torments, what it says over in 1 John 4, 18. There is a greater motivation than fear, and that's love. And if a person could really understand how much God loves us, if they could understand that He dealt with all of our sin, it would make our love for Him go up even more than what it is. And we would wind up living holier accidentally than we ever have on purpose before. Love is a greater motivator than fear. Fear is a motivator, but love is a greater motivator that doesn't have any of the side effects. You know, if you've ever watched a program on television and you see a commercial for some kind of a medication, then it'll talk about, but... It could cause death. It could cause this. And the side effects to it are terrible. Well, with fear, fear can motivate people to serve God, but the side effects of fear are torment and condemnation, and it keeps God at arm's length. The love of God will cause a person to serve God, and it won't have any of those negative side effects. Anyway, I've got a lot more to share. I'm out of time today. I'm going to continue this on my program tomorrow. Please remember that I'm offering this book as a gift to you. This book will go into all the things we're talking about, and it'll go into a lot more detail. And I encourage you to please get it. We've also got this in an audio book. I've got a Spanish copy of my book and a workbook. Uh, We've got DVDs, CDs, USB. We've got this little video that is an illustrated teaching where I'm teaching, but someone has illustrated what I'm talking about. And all of these things are just to help you get hold of these truths that we're talking about. I promise you, it's a life changer. So listen to our announcer and please call or write today. I've got some great news to share with you, and that is that Karis Bible College is just bursting at the seams. We are now actually over 1,100 students on campus and about, uh, I think it's 8,000 or so that are worldwide. And as a result, the Lord has spoken to me and told me that it's time that we've got to build student housing, a student activity center, a uh, athletic center, a hotel and conference center, and a performing arts center in order to be able to accommodate this growth. So I have a place on our website, awmi.net slash campus, that if you go there, you can see an artist's rendering. We actually have a flyover where you can see the entire campus. You can go inside of the buildings and see what they're gonna look like, and it's gonna be awesome. And also, I'm asking people to join with me. You know, we are making a difference. 
We live in a woke culture. Satan is trying to destroy not only Christianity, but the foundation of this nation, which is linked to Christianity. And I believe that raising up disciples is the only way we're going to see this thing turned around. It's not just a physical answer. It's a spiritual answer. So we are doing our part here at Karis Bible College. I believe it's becoming a dominant factor, but in order to continue to expand, we've got to accommodate these students. So I ask you to go to that awmi.net slash campus and look at our proposed building plans for the next 10 years, and we need people to stand with us on a monthly basis. I ask you to pray about it. If God has blessed you, if this is helping you, help us to help other people, and in turn, they will go out and make a huge difference in this nation. God bless you. Remember, it's awmi.net slash campus. I wanted to let you know that we have now teamed up with a ministry called I Donate so that we can receive cars and boats and stocks and jewelry. We have only done this a very short period of time and already we've had tens of thousands of dollars worth of things donated. People, you know, that don't have cash, but they have something that they want to donate. So if you're interested in that, you can follow the information on the screen and participate. And we would love to help you give these assets to the ministry. Andrew is offering his book, Spirit, Soul, and Body, as his free gift to you today. This book is available in English or Spanish and is limited to one free book per household. This offer is available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. Andrew's complete series, Spirit, Soul, and Body, is available in a book and study guide in either English or Spanish and as an audiobook on CD or as a DVD album recorded live at a ministry event. This teaching is also available in a newly updated CD or DVD album and as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. Also available is the Spirit, Soul and Body Illustrated DVD and USB. Each of these valuable resources is available when you contact us. Or you can get these valuable resources as part of the Spirit, Soul, and Body package in your choice of either a CD album, TV, DVD album, or as a USB. Also, this package will include the Spirit, Soul, and Body book, study guide, audiobook, and illustrated DVD or USB. The Spirit, Soul, and Body package has a catalog value of $140 but you can receive all of these valuable resources today for just $99. Go to awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order.